also um, to have an opportunity to, to discuss with them uh, issues related to uh, the Fiji Liquor Break, the uh, for Coffee Break, and we will also take that. I would um, therefore um, uh, I leave that to the. And the Honourable Prime Minister. Uh, Your Excellency, the Ambassador of Indonesia and members of the Core CTI Group, Your Excellencies, the Ambassador of the United States of America, the British High Commissioner to Fiji, the Regional Representative of the Office of the United Nations Human, uh, Human Rights Commissioner, the Deputy Head of Delegation of the European Union, the Director of Public Prosecutions, the Deputy Commissioner of Police, the APT General Secretary, of course. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and a very good morning to you all. On behalf of the Fijian government, it gives us great pleasure to welcome you to the first ever regional workshop of the United Nations Convention Against Torture held in the Pacific. The Fijian government is firmly committed to advancing and protecting the fundamental principles and values of universal human rights enunciated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights whilst cultivating an ethos of a responsible human rights culture. To this end, the Fijian government, at its second universal periodic review cycle, reaffirmed its commitment to ratifying nine of the core international human rights instruments by the year 2020. We are pleased to announce that Fiji has ratified four out of these nine core conventions, which are Convention on the Rights of the Child, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDO, International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, or CERD, and Convention Against Torture. In relation to CERD, on 10th of August 2012, and I think it's very important to note this, the Beni Marama government and our Prime Minister notify the Secretary General of the withdrawal of reservations and declarations made upon ratification on 11th of January 1973, which is when Fiji ratified CERD, but had a very important reservation. At the time of ratification, one of the reservations made was in relation to political rights under Article 5C, which guaranteed the right to participate in elections on the basis of universal and equal suffrage. Fiji, however, had a reservation to this. At that time, because previously, under the 1990, uh, sorry, under the 1970 Constitution, under the 1990 Constitution, under the 1997 Constitution, the, those constitutions mandated voting along ethnic lines, or some people call it racial lines. So therefore, with the coming in of the 2013 Constitution, which removed the requirement to vote along ethnic lines, the 2014 general elections with the removal by the Beni Marama government of that reservation, and indeed by the constitution <coughs> removing that um, impediment, the 2014 general elections were not conducted under an electoral system that had racial discrimination, as in the past, and thereby guaranteed free and fair elections and full participation by all Fijians. It meant also that the votes of all Fijians were equal to everybody else. We are pleased to also announce that this year, the government also presented to parliament the motion to ratify the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And we expect the Parliamentary Committee on Foreign Affairs and Defense, which is the committee that deals with ratification, to present the report to Parliament in the first sitting in the new year, in 2017, in February. Which means basically that, and we of course expect Parliament to approve this, that by February of this year, Fiji would have ratified five out of the nine core international conventions. Ladies and gentlemen, the Fijian government realizes and accepts that cases and allegations of torture and ill-treatment are not unique to Fiji, as the Honorable Prime Minister highlighted, or indeed to the Pacific. This is a global issue, and in order to address this, domestic law and policies must be in conformity to the Convention. And indeed, we would argue 
that the development of jurisprudence is critically important also to support the laws and indeed the policies that are being put in place. And just by way of background, I'd like to very quickly um, give you a short um, demonstration of the issues that face actually us that help us and indeed are challenges to us. Firstly, I'd like to start off with the Fijian Constitution. The Fijian Constitution, ladies and gentlemen and your excellencies, has a very comprehensive Bill of Rights. For the first time in Fiji, it creates conditions for the realization of civil and political rights, but also at the same time, including social and economic rights, where the state is legally obligated to the advancement, protection, and promotion of these rights. But more importantly also, the rights application in Fiji no longer is simply confined to the vertical application of rights, but now the horizontal application of rights. In other words, these rights are also enforceable against private actors within the state. So even as our provision, as the Honorable Prime Minister highlighted in the Constitution, it talks about torture not just by the state per se, but also in homes, in schools, and other private places. Similarly, we have now rights, for example, in terms of the uh, unfair discrimination, Section 26 being applicable to also private actors within the states, whether they, uh, you know, private clubs, associations, etc. It does extend to those groups too. Section 11 of the Constitution also talks about specifically the cruel and degrading treatment. Now, I, I, I don't want to read out all of it, and we can, of course, we'll be having discussions in the workshop, but it does extend to, as has been highlighted, <coughs> the physical, mental, or emotional treatment, and also the right to be free from cruel, inhumane, degrading, or disproportionate severe treatment or punishment. It also says every person has a right to freedom from scientific or medical treatment or procedures without an order of the court or without his or her informed consent or if he or she is incapable of giving informed consent without the informed consent of a lawful guardian. It is prudent to argue, as the Honorable Prime Minister highlighted, that Section 11 of the Constitution, in fact, goes beyond the provision that has been set out in the Convention as it extends to the home, school, and work. We also have, a under Section 87 of the Crimes Decree, we have a provision relating to torture. And a person who commits an indictable offense by inflicting severe physical or mental pain or suffering upon one or more persons who are in custody or under the control of the perpetrator. B, the pain or suffering that or incidental to lawful sanctions. And the perpetrator's conduct is committed intentionally or knowingly as part of a widespread or systemic attack directed against a civilian population. So much wider implications. Indeed, ladies and gentlemen, one can argue that with all of these provisions in place, that it was not difficult for the Fijian government to rectify the United Nations Convention against torture. The jurisprudence in Fiji, ladies and gentlemen, also interestingly, has developed over the past few years. There was one particular case that, uh, in fact, I was involved in when I was working in the DPP's office, a case called Taito Rarasea uh, versus the state, in which a prisoner had appealed against a six-month imprisonment sentence for escaping from lawful custody, contrary to the, pen the then penal code. The then commissioner of prisons also decided to impose other relevant punishments under the Prisons Act, which included him not getting enough food. So because he had escaped and he was caught, and while the court was giving him an additional sentence, the Commissioner of Prison decided to reduce his food ration. He in fact took that matter to the court, and the presiding judge uh, then, uh, who, was, who subsequently became a vice president, and unfortunately only a few weeks ago passed away, uh, Ratuchone Manraiwiwi, in fact, gave a ruling to say that it was inhumane and degrading treatment. It was cruel treatment. That you should not 
be punishing somebody twice, but also at the same time you had no right to deprive them of food. And in fact, what is interesting too is that at that time, Fiji had not ratified the Convention Against Torture. At that time, in fact, ratified the covenant of economic, social, and cultural rights. But because the then constitution, in the particular provision is now, allows the judges in Fiji to refer to international law as far as uh, enforcement of rights are concerned. So that gives them the latitude to be able to refer to cases offshore. So that also helps in developing the jurisprudence within the Fijian, jurisprudence, uh, Fijian jurisdiction itself. There was also another case in 2005, a case of Subhash Mani and Ramendra Kumar, where there was allegations of police brutality. And in that particular case, because there were commuted fractures that the, uh, the person in custody had in fact uh, received because of his time in custody, he was also awarded damages in the sum of $129,000. Now all of these cases is in general developed prior to the ratification of the Convention Against Torture. So it is very important to see that with the ratification of the Convention, we already had existing jurisprudence, which can be referred to. And indeed, it will help us in terms of the enforcement of the various provisions that has now been put in local, uh, uh, local legislation. Our road to uh, specific road to uh, ratification of UNCAT, in fact, uh, started off with the opening of our office in Geneva, with our representative in, in Geneva. The ambassador was asked to meet the Association of Prevention of Torture, APT, in fact, started those discussions and talked about the ratification. Following that, of course, and ladies and gentlemen, I have to highlight in particular to those of the Pacific Island countries, it is very critical to have the political will to be able to see it through. And I'm very glad to say that our Prime Minister had the political will to see this through all the way. So the APT, with APT's assistance, Fiji then presented the motion to Parliament, because under our Constitution, in order for us to be able to ratify any international convention, we need to, as provided for under Section 51 of the Constitution, to get parliamentary approval. So we put a motion to Parliament, and then Parliament, of course, referred the matter to the committee, which is the Foreign Affairs and Defence Committee, for further analysis and public consultations. Following that, the, um, the committee, of course, received submissions from civil society groups and various other stakeholders, including individual members of the society. And there was an overwhelming response that should ratify the United Nations Convention Against Torture. The ratification of the convention then, of course, following the committee's uh, report to parliament, was debated in parliament, and the convention was ratified. I, as uh, some remarks have been made about uh, Fiji's reservations, and we've alluded to the reservation on Article 1. Of course, our argument is that the, uh, the, the scope of torture in Fiji is far wider than, of course, what has been provided for in the Convention itself. There's also a reservation on Article 14, and these, of course, can be discussed, but we also have to highlight, for example, Article 14, which is in respect of compensation, uh, New Zealand, for example, has a similar reservation in respect of Article 14, <coughs> 20 in respect of the competent authority. We have also other countries such as Israel that have uh, reservations on this, similarly with Article 30. Um, we have countries like France, South Africa, uh, China and Israel that have reservations. And of course, in respect of Article um, the general reservation, which the UK also shares with us. And it would be good for us to, be have, to have those discussions in respect when we have the actual workshop itself. In respect of the uh, ratification, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are pleased to announce that we've identified a number of the areas for priority in the implementation of the convention. Uh, of course, these include the reform of the uh, police interrogation procedures, 
and the effective implementation of the right to counsel, uh, which is guaranteed under the Fijian Constitution. What I think, ladies and gentlemen, is also very important that we tend to forget is that we must have complementarity. Basically meaning we must have other laws to support the actual, uh, the, the practicalities of this particular convention. Let me highlight a specific example. Now, generally, a lot of countries do not have specific laws, for example, pertaining to the beating up of women, or what we call generally domestic violence. Now, the Fijian government, again, under the leadership of a prime minister, put in place the domestic violence decree. Now, many people, and indeed many countries, this kind of goes under the, under the radar. Firstly, it is uh, seen to be something to, that belongs to the private sphere, that is not brought into the public sphere. Go through torture, whether it's emotional or physical torture. Now, generally speaking, to be able to say that this is torture specifically, or if you were to, as we had a provision under the penal code previously, seen as common assault. In Fiji's case previously, common assault was what you call a reconcilable offense. So if the two parties got together, you could actually reconcile. So you found many cases when the laws did not actually support the person's ability to have that confidence to bring that complaint in the first place, many of these sort of fell through the cracks. And indeed, if it was brought up at the prosecutorial level, there was a lot of pressure, social pressure, sometimes economic pressure, to actually reconcile with this. To have a specific law to deal with, for example, domestic violence, it does address a wide spectrum of people who in everyday life, one can argue, is going through torture if that is not being highlighted. Similarly, uh, again under the Beni Marama government in 2013, we brought about the Child Welfare Decree, where it is now mandatory for a doctor or any other person that provides a particular service, uh, social worker, etc., to report if they suspect that a person is being abused. Many times, you know, you have somebody, a child, may go to a doctor, I have all sorts of bruises, a woman may go to the doctor with all sorts of bruises and say, well, I fell down the stairs, I walked into the door. But if the doctor believes that those injuries are not necessarily commensurate with what is being said, then obviously they have a ob legal obligation now to report it. So complementarity is very, very important, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Similarly, we have a new law in place, a bill, I should say, before Parliament. But it's also freedom of information, or what is called freedom of information in many countries, we call it the information bill. Now, that obviously gives people access to information to records pertaining to them specifically. We similarly ratify the United Nations Convention Against, Con uh, against uh, Corruption. All of these laws combine to create an environment that makes complaint, the complaints mechanism a lot more conducive to individuals who may feel marginalized against various institutions or larger groups of people. It gives them the level of confidence to make those complaints. Access to information. Participation in the ability to be able to access the information is also very, very critical. So it is not a straight jacket. It's not simply a question of ratifying the convention per se. You need to have various laws that will actually help build up that culture, that ethos, as the Honorable Prime Minister talked about, in bringing about that cultural change. And that is very, very critical. Now, as has been highlighted, that in many cases, the, there has been, for a number of years, a lack of investment, for example, in interrogation uh, methodologies, in training of police officers, in accessibility to, for example, forensic technology. If, for example, police officers do not have access to technology, uh, we found, for example, uh, when we came into government, many police departments did not even have proper funding for even fingerprinting, DNA access. And then, of course, there's pressure to bring about the perpetrators of crimes that may gain a lot of public attention 
then the police can also feel pressured to use techniques that is of course not recommended. This is not an excuse, but it is a practicality that we must be able to address. And of course, if the laws also are commensurate with the level of violence that are being perpetrated by people who are actually committing offences, there is also a problem. In Fiji, for example, for a number of years, we've had issues of domestic violence, but also sexual assaults. And in fact, frankly, the laws were a bit of a joke. The sentencing that was being meted out to these people was a bit of a joke. So we've amended the laws. We have, for example, removed rules of corroboration, the old Victorian rules pertaining to corroboration pertaining to rape have been removed. We had a penal code that was almost 120 years old. We now have a crimes uh, decree that is a lot more modern, remo removes corroboration, and various other impediments, removes the gender-specific type of offenses, brings about a gender-neutral uh, provisions within the crimes decree. All of these things are very, very important. It's very, very critical. And this goes towards complementarity. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we also, of course, when that culture is built within the police, it does take some time to remove that. But one of the quickest way of doing that, of course, is to give them access to technology, is to give them access to the training that is very critical. Very critical. I'd like to again uh, re-echo the Prime Minister's uh, appreciation to the uh, British government and also the European Union for providing that much needed support and indeed recognizing that it's very critical to have the training to be able to build strong institutions and long-lasting institutions, which invariably goes to the maintenance and upholding and building the culture of the rule of law. Ladies and gentlemen, of course, the judiciary is the Honorable Chief Justice, who unfortunately could not be here uh, this morning, has also implemented uh, and is working together uh, with various initiatives of the Fiji Police Force uh, to implement, for example, video interviewing of all suspects in custody, and this year, earlier this year, we had representatives from the Office of the Attorney General, the Legal Aid Commission, and the Fiji Law Society met with the representative of the Geneva Bar Convention in Switzerland and with the Legal Aid Commission UK to see how the right to counsel could be effectively implemented through the first hour procedure, which ensured the presence of a legal practitioner within the first hour of custody to explain the right personally to the suspect. Uh, we have again uh, engaged in a pilot program on the first hour procedure and video recording interview. And uh, these were also presented by the Honorable Chief Justice during the 33rd session of the Human Rights Council that was held from the 13th to the 30th of September in 2016. And the Fijian Mission in Geneva also co-hosted a side event with the Association of the Prevention of Torture in Geneva at, at that time. Uh, we would also like to highlight that the Honorable Chief Justice is currently working on a draft practice direction intended to guide both the judges and the prosecution on the expected requirements for the admission of videotaped statements. Ratification, of course, uh, ladies and gentlemen, has opened up avenues for discussion, possible reviews of the police and correction services manuals and upgrading of cell facilities at police stations and remand centers throughout Fiji. Ratification, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, um, of this important human rights instrument ensures that people, of course, are protected, but it also sends out a very strong message to say that we are committed to this particular value, to this particular system, and to this particular way of dealing with those people, in particular those who are in custody, which is where we find where most breaches do take place. I would also very quickly like to highlight that as we've seen, sometimes the ratification of conventions we do tend to get caught up with the bureaucracy of it. So we seem to be more focused on the reporting side. I think many of you would agree, see many heads shaking. We tend to get caught up with reporting. But the real reason for actually ratifying this convention is the practical implementation of the provisions of these conventions. It's not the reporting per se, reporting may be important, but it's the actual implementation making sure the values that are in these conventions are actually running on the ground and they actually do provide for the human dignity which we are all concerned about. 
Um, of course, uh, the ratification process, as seen here today, uh, opens up doors to bilateral and multilateral assistance and cooperation from various states to the Convention. And we'd like to urge all the other Pacific Island states to take advantage of that. Um, interestingly enough also, um, it does contribute to the achievement or attainment of the Sustainable Development Goal 16, which is to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we'd like to thank you all for your participation here. We'd like to in particular thank the Honourable Prime Minister who has a very busy schedule, he's just returned from overseas, uh, to be here with us today. And that goes to show the importance that the Fijian government, the Fijian leadership is placing in respect of our obligations to the inter core international conventions and our quest to also remedy many of the issues of the past and to start on a clean page. And we look forward to our development partners to assist us. It is also very critical to highlight, and has been highlighted also by the, uh, the Honorable Excellency, the Ambassador, that the issue is not about a blame game. The issue is about assisting each other to be able to help achieve those objectives. The issue is not about turning it into a political issue, but the issue is about bringing home the point that it's about individuals who may have breached and individuals, in fact, more so, who have actually suffered, and how we can stop that. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for being here. We'd like to urge the other Pacific Island countries who are here um, to ratify the convention. We also would like to offer our assistance to APT in facilitating any regional meetings, any regional uh, workshops they do want to have in the future, and also on a bilateral basis to the other Pacific Island countries should they require any assistance we are willing to help you. I'd like to thank you once again. Those of you who have not visited Fiji, uh, Bulobinaka once again, and welcome to Fiji. And as the Prime Minister said, please make, uh, enjoy our beautiful scenery and also the warmth of the Fijian people. I wish you good morning. Thanks.